Thank you for participating in this introduction to hydrography. My name is Stephen Howden and I'm with the University of Southern Mississippi. So here's a product that you would see from hydrographic surveying. It's a nautical chart. <clears throat> in this case, it includes the port at Tema. And this chart shows a number of features. It shows the depth. Um, it discusses what the reference datum is for, for this chart, which we'll talk about later in the lecture. It gives the land, land features and uh, areas where it's deep enough that the mariner doesn't have to worry too much about depths versus when it's shallower and more attention has to be paid to the particular depths. So we're gonna go into today the various things that go into making a chart like this, but also the other uses of the data that hydrographers collect. The first question is, what is hydrography? For many oceanographers, when they hear the term hy hydrography, they think of temperature and salinity sections, like these from, from the WOS program. But that's not what we're talking about today. So here's the definition from the International Hydrographic Organization. Hydrography is the branch of applied sciences which deals with the measurement and description of the physical features of oceans, seas, coastal areas, lakes, and rivers, as well as with the prediction of their changes over time for the primary purpose of safety of navigation and in support of all other marine activities, including economic development, security and defense, scientific research, and environmental protection. So this is pretty broad, the uh, areas that hydrography touches on. Here is a very partial list of the importance of hydrography. So the first thing I have here is nautical charting and supporting safe and efficient navigation of sh ships, which is kind of the traditional role. The development and maintenance of the marine transportation system, resource exp exploitation, and, and I should also mention uh, protection. Maritime boundary delimitation, coastal zone management, tsunami flood and inundation modeling, maritime defense and security, national marine spatial data infrastructures, environmental protection, recreational boating, tourism, habitat mapping, and marine science. So here is um, just an example of hydrographic surveying in a very important river, in this case, the Mississippi River. So here is a, a video of a container ship coming down the Mississippi River. The chart to the bottom left shows uh, an overlay of recent bathymetric surveying by hydrographers showing the deep areas, uh, for example, around the bend in that by Algiers. And, it, and these ships are really important for world commerce. 90% of all international goods are transported on ships. The, and ships are becoming larger and larger. So each inch of extra inch of draft, how deep the ship is in the water, can mean an extra $5 million of cargo. So there's really an incentive to make ships bigger and bigger, but that requires deeper and deeper ports for them to operate in. Hydrographic surveying is needed to do that dredging to make sure ports are deep enough. So you have to know how much material needs to be re removed. And then whoever's paying the dredgers needs to be able to make sure that that amount of material has actually been removed. With global warming and the opening of the Arctic, uh, so more sea ice loss, there are more and more ships and bigger ships transiting through the Arctic Ocean. And a lot of that is uncharted. And so there needs to be a lot of charting in the Arctic Ocean. For resource ex exploitation like oil and gas, we have these large structures that have to be moored and you have to know something about the seafloor where they're being moored. You have to know something about the, um, what's underneath the sediments. Of course, the geologists are using 
very low frequency sound to get information on the composition, the layering of the, the sediments below the surface. But the surface sediments have to be known for the mooring uh, structures. And when we get to things like renewable energy, so things like these wind farms, you have to do surveying to make sure that you've got suitable sites for the moorings and that you know where you're going to lay your cables to shore where that energy is going to travel through. And then once they're in place, you've got to know, is there scouring around the structures? You know, it, do, do some kind of remedial action have to be taken? And that requires hydrographic surveying. Increasingly, to feed the growing world's population, offshore aquaculture is going to play a, a major role. And so there, these are some examples of large offshore aquaculture structures. And these have to be moored on the seafloor somehow. And there has to be some knowledge of what are the sediments, where the anchors are going to be, can, you know, what type of anchors need to be in place to keep these structures in place in case of storms. So that requires hydrographic surveying. Also, hydrographic surveying is very important for maritime boundary delimitation. And this is just an example of an article about the Arctic Ocean as the as sea ice is lost and there's more availability to the resources on the sea floor. Some of the countries are fighting over where those boundaries are. And those boundaries by international law are based upon uh, various uh, features on the seafloor. Coastal zone management is important. Here's an example uh, in Louisiana where I live where there's a lot of loss of the wetlands. And that has big implications for resources like uh, oysters, fisheries, you know, nurseries for the fisheries, for storm protection. And so hydrographic surveying needs to be done for coastal zone managers to understand the morphology of the, of the coastline in the underlying water. For inundation models, if there's a hurricane coming and we have numerical models that predict what the storm surge should be, those models require bathymetry. So they require bathymetry that's resolved on the same link scales as the model does. Localized storm surge is very much depends upon the local bathymetry. So that's got to be mapped very well to get good storm surge prediction. And here's an example of products from hydrographic surveying. So here is a map from multi-beam survey, and I'll discuss that in a moment. So this, this color on the left is the depth of the water, and the legend shows you in meters how deep it is. And then on the right is some images in the region from side scan survey, which I'll describe also in a moment to see some obstructions on the seafloor that could be dangerous to navigation. So this bathymetry map on the left could be useful for modelers. It could be useful for people doing fisheries where you know, this hole, this deep hole here in this channel is important. And it's also important for nautical charts. So here's an example of a nautical chart on the left and on the right is the underlying bathymetric data. So the chart is what a navigator would use. And the, and the chart and the high resolution bathymetry underlying that chart would be used by a range of resource managers, marine resource managers. So maritime boundaries are very important. So for the extended continental shelf formula lines, formula one is you find the foot of the slope and go out 60 nautical miles. Formula two, the sediment thickness equals 1% of the distance to foot of slope. 
And that can be, either of those two formulas can be chosen to determine the outer edge of its continental margin. Of course, this requires hydrographic survey. There are also Article 76 also provides two constraint lines that the two formulas cannot exceed. So the first maximum is 350 nautical miles from baseline or uh, max two is 2,500 meter isobath plus 100 meters. The International Hydrographic Organization is the international organization that sets the standards for hydrographic survey. And they do that along with um, the the International Federation of Surveyors and the International Cartographic Organization. It was established in 1921. It's an intergovernmental consultative and technical organization to support the safety of navigation and protection of the marine environment. It has UN observer status and has been recognized as a UN competent technical authority for hydrography and nautical charting. Here's a plot of the member states. Green are members, red is our suspended members, yellow is non-member coastal state, gray is others, or landlocked non-member states. In the Gulf of Guinea, the members are Ghana, which joined in 2019, Nigeria, and Cameroon. So as I mentioned, the IHO sets the water level requirements and they have a document called S44, which is the standards for hydrographic surveys. So how is it done? So before 1940, the depths were all done with lead lines. So a line uh, with a heavy lead weight was dropped to the seafloor and the amount of line paid out was uh, determined and there might be a correction for kind of an angle of that the, the line was hanging from the ship to make it a vertical uh, correction. And then with in the 40s through the 80s, single beam echo sounders became available. And those would send an acoustic pulse down to the seafloor. The round trip travel time for the acoustic pulse to hit the seafloor and come back to the ship was measured. And if we know the speed of sound of the, in the water, then the depth would be one half the round trip travel time times the speed of sound. And the speed of sound depends on temperature, salinity, and pressure. So where acoustic beams obliquely encounter changes in sound speed, they will refract. So we need to know if we're not having beams that are perpendicular to surfaces that separate different sound speeds, then we have to know something about how sound speed varies in the vertical and the horizontal to correct for refraction. This is more, more of a problem with multi-beam surveying. So in the 1990s, multi-beams were developed. And this has a swath of acoustic energy that is measured in, in these different beams from different areas of the seafloor coming back to the multi-beam measure the depth at different angles. So here's a little animation of a multi-beam taking measurements. It is measuring depth across its track from the multi-beam swath and a long track due to the forward motion of the ship. A similar technique is used for, for aircraft which have uh, lasers, so LIDAR. So the ranging is done with LIDAR and they measure the backscatter from the seafloor and the sea surface so the depth of the water is able to be determined from an aircraft. Another way, though it's, it's much more coarse, and is satellite altimetry and bathymetry. So in this diagram, we have a seamount. And a seamount is denser than the surrounding ocean. What that means is that there's going to be a stronger gravitational acceleration as we get close to a seamount. So for, if we can measure the Grav acceleration due to gravity, which is a gravitation corrected for, well, gravitation plus the acceleration component 
um, perpendicular to the spin axis of the Earth. As we our ship gets closer to the seamount, the gravity vectors will start to bend towards the seamount because it's denser than the surrounding water. Now, from geodesy and physics, we know that a line of constant geopotential is perpendicular to gravity everywhere. And in the absence of any forcing or mean motion of the water, the sea surface would, would follow a equal potential surface of the, of the geopotential. And because the gravity vectors are pointing towards the seamount in that region, it means that the geopotential surface must follow a line like that sea surface in this diagram. So that means where there's a seamount, there's going to be a rise in sea level. Conversely, if there's a, if there's a, uh, a trench, then there's going to be a depression in the sea level. So satellite altimeters are measuring this, the sea surface from space using electromagnetic waves. And we'll measure the change in the sea surface due to these gravitational um, anomalies, due to things like seamounts and trenches. Now, for a number of reasons, the seafloor features are large enough, then this effect is reduced. So there's kind of a range of scales of which seafloor uh, changes can be detected from space with altimeters. Back in 2005, there was a, a, a bad accident where a U.S. submarine hit an uncharted seamount. And it turns out that the, the seamount it hit was actually in the altimeter data. And this led to the charting agencies paying more attention to the features in the satellite altimeter data. Okay, in addition to multi-beam, uh, multi single beam, LIDAR, satellite altimeters, another thing, technique that's used for hydrography is side scan sonar. So this is, a, we're back to acoustic techniques. And this figure shows a, what's called a tow fish down here with a, uh, with a side scan sonar. It's being towed near the sea floor, or off the sea floor, and it sends out acoustic pulse to either side of the side scan. And then it gets, it has a number of transducers and is able to determine uh, where the energy is coming back from in range and along the swath. And down on the left, you see a target. So where there's a target, um, there's going to be energy that's scattered back to the towfish. And what's behind that is a shadow zone. So what that looks like in practice, you get images like this on the left. So on the right, you see the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, which was a cargo ship that operated on the Great Lakes in the US and Canada. And in 1975, it, on Lake Superior, there was a bad storm and the ship sank. So the left picture is a side scan sonar image of the, of the hull of the ship on the bottom of the lake. And you can see these bright areas and dark areas where you have a strong image, a strong backscatter of acoustic energy, and then you have a shadow zone. So the left image is the 100 meter range scale, so higher frequency, and the lower picture is a uh, coarser image at the 500 meter scale at lower frequency. Okay, so if we have a boat and we're measuring the depth of the water acoustically, we are measuring the distance from the transducer to the seafloor. So assuming we know the 
um, orientation that the transducer is pointing. In this picture, the transducer is pointing directly down. And we know this, this the um, sound speed. Then we can accurately get the depth from the transducer to the sea floor. By adding to that the depth of the transducer from the water level, we can get the depth of the water level at the ship. For charting, what we want is instead of that depth, we want the water level, we want the depth of the water when it's at chart datum, which is a concept we're gonna to get to in, in, in a bit. For this example, I'm using mean low, low water. So the dash line is the water level when it's at mean low, low water. And what we want for our nautical chart is how deep the seafloor is from the mean low, low water line. From a ship, we're measuring the depth of the water from the seafloor. So we need to subtract the water level relative to chart datum. And that's going to depend on the stage of the tide. And it can be other effects to uh, do other effects as well as such as wind setup and a range of other factors. The transducer is not always pointing parallel to the local gravity. The ship can pitch a roll, so the angle of the transducer can be straight down what is called nadir, or it can be at an, at an angle relative to nadir. We have to know where the ship is to geolocate it. What is its latitude and longitude when it's taking the measurement? In the modern tools used to measure, to monitor the vessel geolocation orientation are still compasses. The global navigation satellite system, which includes the GPS system, the US system, global positioning system. The GLONASS system, which is the Russian system the European Galileo system and the, and the Beidou system from China. And then inertial measurement units. And they have three axis accelerometers, gyroscopes and magnetometers. So one of the things we have to do is we have to know where the transducer is relative to these navigational sensors. And so one of the things we have to do is called a vessel configuration survey. So here's a vessel. It's got GNSS antennas up on the top where they have a clear view of the sky. There's a multi-beam pole where the multi-beam gets mounted. Inside the hull is a inertial measurement unit. And so if we have the vessel here on land, we can use total stations, uh, tape measures, and other measuring devices to get the relative positions of all these, of the hull of the vessel and all these instruments. And this is what it looks like for um, our RV Lemoyne that we have at USM. So we have our vessel, we have a coordinate center of the or coordinate origin that we determine. We have locations of GNSS antennas, the multi-beam pole mount. We have, the, we have the vertical and horizontal offsets of every piece of equipment, as well as the hull, hull. And that allows us to convert measurements from one instrument location to another instrument location. Now the, the water line to, to transducer can vary. So from the vessel configuration, we have where the transducer is relative to um, anywhere on the boat. When we put the boat in the water, it's going to have a certain draft. That's called the static draft. If we have the boat, it's not in motion. So that's the water line when the vessel is not moving. So then if we know the static draft, we'll know where the, how deep the transducer is if we have the boat 
at, you know, tied up to a dock. When the vessel moves, the water line can change with respect to the vessel. So we need to measure that with respect to, to the water at a range of survey speeds. And I write with respect to the water because if there's a current in the water, what's important is not the motion of the vessel with respect to land, but the motion of the vessel with respect to the current. So if the boat is moving up a river at two knots and the river's moving against it at two knots, then relative to the water, the boat's moving at four knots. So once the vessel's in motion, it may create squat. So the vessel is lower in the water or lift, vessel is higher in the water, depending upon the speed of the vessel, the sea state, and the hull type. Secondly, we have what's called heave. So if you've ever been in a boat out where there are waves, the boat's moving up and down with the waves. And what we want is not the instantaneous height of the boat as it moves up and down the waves, but we want to know if we could average out those waves, what is the, the, the water depth. So we need to remove the effect of heave, and that can be done with GNSS measurements, IMU, or a combination of the two. So now what about the water line to chart datum? Because remember, we need to remove the water line to chart datum in order to convert our sounding to depth below chart datum. Now, chart datums can be different types. So in the coast and open ocean, we use tidal datums. On lakes and rivers, they use other datums. I'm not gonna talk in detail about lakes and rivers. If you have questions about that though, I can answer them if you send me uh, a message. So tidal datums. There are many different types of tidal datums. Some examples are mean sea level and NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US, defines mean sea level as the arithmetic mean of hourly heights observed over the national tidal datum epoch. So the national tidal datum epoch is a time period of 19 years. And the reason it's 19 years is because that encompasses the, the time period that the lunar nodes take to do one cycle. So that's something that Dr. Arbic discussed in his tidal lecture. So that mean is done over a full cycle of the progression of the lunar nodes. And that's the longest period that's really of in, in the astronomic forcing that's important for tides for hydrography. Mean high water is the average of all high water heights observed over the national tidal, tidal datum epoch. Mean low or low water, which in the US is the legal definition of chart datum, is the average of the lower low water heights of each tidal day observed over the national tidal datum epoch. And then lowest astronomic tide is the lowest tide level from harmonic analysis. So if you do a harmonic analysis, which includes the nodal cycle, it would be the lowest predicted tide over 19 years of uh, predictions. Lowest astronomic tide is usually shortened to LAT, and this is the chart datum for most countries in the world. So it's an important one. Now, of course, tidal datums require tide gauges and parenthetically are marked and potentially tidal models. So tidal models can also be used to, to determine a tidal datum there's some more information that has to be included and really tide gauge data needs to be available to make sure the tide model is good. So in the US and some other countries, there's a national network of long-term tide gauges that serve as primary gauges for hydrographic surveying. Some of these are included in global tide gauge networks. 
there's not enough of these gauges to be able to use them, only them, for hydrographic surveying in various places. So if more tie gauges are required for hydrographic survey, then secondary stations are installed for the length of the survey, but not less than 30 days. A technique known as tidal datum transfer for a primary gauge is used to obtain equivalent long-term datums at a secondary gauge. Or in some cases, no tidal harmonic constituents and or modeling can be used to obtain chart datum. Now, in addition to what I said for the, the US national gauge system, there's the international sea level data centers. So there's the Global Sea Level Observing System, or GLOSS, and here's the URL for it. It was established by the UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, or IOC, in 1985. It's part of the Global Oceanographic Observing System, or GOOS, and provides oversight and coordination for global and regional sea level networks. So this is the place you can go to for high quality tide gauge data for different regions of the world. And it's one of the observing components under the WMO, or World Meteorological Organization, IOC Joint Technical Commission for Oceanography and Marine Meteorology. There's also these international sea level data centers. So there's the PSMSL, the Permanent Service for Mean Sea Level, and there's the URL for that. This was founded in 1933. It's a global data bank for long-term sea level information from tie gauges with the earliest data set from 1807. It's used by the IPCC for sea level trends and it is a GLOSS designated data center. There's also the University of Hawaii Sea Level Center. Again, the URL. This is again part of GLOSS now. It's a designated data center. And this is where you can go for fast delivery QC tie gauge data. So within one to two months of data collection with basic QC uh, added to it or performed on it to make sure there's no large level shifts or obvious outliers. There's also research quality data in addition to the fast delivery data. And these are considered to be the final science ready data set. So this final QC process takes one to two years to um, be completed from collection. And there's the uh, British Oceanographic Data Center, which is another GLOSS de designated data center. So frequently you may, so if you're doing a hydrographic survey, you may have a tie gauge from one of these, um, it, that's part of one of these international centers or national centers, but frequently you're gonna have to put in at least one, maybe more, temporary tie gauges or secondary tie gauges. So you have to do an installation. And these are some photographs of a USM class putting in a temporary tie gauge in coastal Mississippi in the US. And so they have a pressure gauge that they're installing on a wall. There's a data logger with a solar panel for power and they're leveling it in to some benchmarks they've established, as well as doing a GNSS survey to do um, to measure, the, to get the tides relative to a geodetic ellipsoid. So the tide correction. Here I show a, a Google image of coastal Mississippi, and that bay is called the Bay of St. Louis, and there's a tie gauge there, one of the NOAA gauges. And say I have a ship, a red ship out there, and it's measuring the soundings. So it's getting the depth of the sound there from the instantaneous water level. And the gauge at the time, say I'm doing a survey and I take a sounding at 0800. The tide gauge is, is recording at that same time an observed tide. The red curve is the observed tide. The blue curve is a predicted tide. 
So the tide gauge at that time recorded a water level of 1.1 meters above mean low, low water. But what is the sea surface above mean low, low water at where the ship is? So the sea surface is 1.1 meter above mean low, low water at the tide gauge, but it's not necessarily gonna be that where the ship is. So we need that to reduce our sounding from the sea water level down to the seafloor to chart datum down to the seafloor. So what we need to do is we need to understand how does the tide out where the ship is, how is it related to the tide at this tide gauge? And what that requires is more tidal information. So we could put some more temporary gauges out along this area and we could look at how does the tide, how does the phase of the tide vary from say past Christiane over to this tide gauge or from Waveland over to this tide gauge. When I say how does the phase vary, if I have a high tide at past Christiane, do I have a high tide later, earlier at the same time at the tide gauge? Similarly, if I have a tide at Waveland, does it occur earlier, later, or at the same time as at the tide gauge? So that's looking at the phase of the tide and also the range of the tide. Is the range of the tide bigger at past Christian than, than at uh, the tide gauge or less than that at the tide gauge? Same for Waveland. So here is a what's called a co-range co-phase chart. And this is not the same area that I just showed, but this is from the Canadian Tidal Manual. So we have an island here with a reference gauge. And the solid, the, the dashed lines here, so there's a set of dashed lines, and the dashed lines show the range of the tide. These are contours of the range of the tide relative to the reference gauge. So here at the reference gauge, all along a, a imaginary dash line through the center here, I would have a range ratio of one. So if I have a range of two meters at a given day, I'm gonna get two meters over here and two meters over here. Up here, I have a factor of 1.05. So whatever the range is at the reference gauge, I multiply it by a factor of 1.05. Back here, I would have a range factor of 0.95. So I have a smaller range over here than I do at the reference gauge. The solid lines are lines of constant phase. So all along the line through the reference gauge parallel to the solid lines, the phase of the tide is the same. So if it's high tide at the reference gauge, it's high tide along that line. If it's low tide at the reference gauge, it's low tide along that line. between where the, the B is, point B, between those two solid lines, the tide occurs 10 minutes earlier. The phase of the tide is 10 minutes earlier there than at the reference gauge. To the left, uh, where A is, between those two solid lines, the phase of the tide occurs 10 minutes later. So if I have a high tide at the reference gauge, there was a high tide 10 minutes earlier in this section between the two solid lines that B is between, and at A, it occurs 10 minutes later between the two solid lines where A is located. So to create a chart like this, you have to have some I wouldn't be able to create a chart like this from just measurements at the reference gauge. I need other surrounding gauges and some knowledge about how the tide propagates in the area to create a chart like this. But we can use charts like this to then correct our soundings. So for example, if I have a boat at point B and I make a sounding of water level to the seafloor, I can estimate the 
distance, the vertical distance from the water level down to chart datum or up to chart datum from the reference gauge, which is measuring water level relative to chart datum in the following fashion. So from a point B, it lies between the two solid lines where the phase of the tide is 10 minutes, occurs 10 minutes earlier. So if I want to reduce the sounding at B, whatever happens at B is going to happen 10 minutes later at A. So I take the measurement at A from 10 minutes after the measurement at B, and I apply a range ratio, which is of 0.95, because it's between these two dash lines where the range ratio is 0.95. So I take the measured value of the tide 10 minutes later than my sounding at B, multiply it times a range ratio, and that, that gives me the height of the tide above the chart datum at B. Point A, it lies between the two solid lines that are 10 minutes later. So if I take a sounding at A, I take the water level measured 10 minutes earlier at the reference gauge, and I apply a range factor of 1.05 because A lies in between the two dash lines that define a range ratio of 1.05. And that's how I reduce my sounding. A whole new approach that's being done is what's called an ellipsoid reference survey. So this decouples the tide work from the hydrographic survey. So in this case, this figure shows an area where the reference ellipsoid is above the mean sea level. So in some parts of the world, it's going to be above, some parts it's going to be below. So there's a GPS antenna on top of the ship. And there's a sounding being made below the ship. So the ship is measuring the distance from the transducer down to the seafloor. And then we know the transducer offset to the antenna. So we can add that to it, that distance to it. And then we can add the antenna to the reference ellipsoid. And that gives us the distance from the reference ellipsoid to the seafloor. So if, this, if the tide were higher, the ship would be farther up and the antenna would be closer to the reference ellipsoid, but the transducer would be farther from the seafloor and we'd still get the same distance between the reference ellipsoid and, and the seafloor. So we can use the ship without worrying about the tides to measure the depth of the seafloor from the reference ellipsoid by using GNSS. Then we can use somebody else's measurement of the chart datum separation to the seafloor, or excuse me, chart datum separation to the ellipsoid. And in the United States, for example, that's being done by NOAA, where they're combining tidal modeling, tidal observations in GNSS to map out the separation between the um, tile, the chart datums and the uh, reference ellipsoid. Okay, so now we want to put all that into a chart. So the basics of what is in a chart. One of the parts of a, important parts of the chart is the mathematical model of the Earth as an ellipsoid of revolution, also known as a horizontal datum onto which we prescribe latitude and longitude. So the shape of the Earth, if it was homogeneous and it wasn't spinning on its axis, it would gravity would would make it a, a spherical shape, but it's spinning on its axis, and that deforms the sphere into an ellipsoid, which is still close to a sphere, but is larger at the equator. And so we can, we can model the shape of the Earth as an ellipsoid of revolution 
and we have to orient that ellipsoid to the earth. And we generally want the center of the ellipsoid to be at the center of mass of the earth, for example. And then the, the shorter axis of the ellipsoid to be aligned with the spin axis of the earth so that the larger axis is aligned with the um, equator. So we have that mathematical model, which we're using for horizontal positioning. We have positions of the coastline in the horizontal datum. We have positions of aids to navigation and dangers to navigation in the horizontal datum. Heights of overhead obstructions with respect to a high tidal datum and their positions with respect to the horizontal datum. And then the depths of the water with respect to the chart datum and horizontal positions with respect to the horizontal datum. And then we use cartographic rules for depicting the data on the, in, the, in a horizontal plane. So we have this kind of ellipsoidally shaped earth and we're taking that surface and representing it in two dimensions. And that's the whole science of map projections we use to do that. So here's a, a very short primer on geodetic datums. And it's kind of going from historical low accuracy method to more modern um, high precision methods. So knowing that in, in these figures are very much uh, the, the distortions are very much exaggerated. But when only land surveying and celestial navigation was possible, then the shape of the earth, the ellipsoidal shape of the earth was estimated from arcs measured in the latitudinal and longitudinal directions in one or several countries to estimate the radius of curvature of the earth in those two orthogonal directions. And a, a ellipsoidal revolution was fit to a kind of a, a local region. And then as you are expanding that over continents, then the ellipsoid that you estimate from all your estimates is even closer to the shape of the earth. And the center of the ellipsoid is closer to the real center of mass of the earth. And this, the semi-minor axis is closer to the real spin axis of the earth. And then once we've had space geodetic measurements in our, we're, getting away from a lot of the biases in land surveying techniques, we get a much better ellipsoidal estimate of the, our model of the earth, where the center of the ellipsoid is at the center of the mass of the total earth. And the, the orientation of it is such that the Z axis of the, of the ellipsoid corresponds with the spin axis of the earth. And so we have these modern geodetic datums, which we use for, in the old methods, we only use them for horizontal positioning, but now we can use them for, for vertical positioning as well, and also for uh, temporal positioning. Because the um, continents are not fixed in place, they're moving. Yes, measurements have gotten better and depending upon the use of the geodetic datum, there can be some real differences. Like in, the, in North America, the North, there's a geodetic datum that's tied to the motion of the North American plate. And that plate is moving with respect to datums such as WGS84. And it's really important to, to understand different geodetic datums and what datum your data are in. And this figure illustrates how important that can be. Because here are two charts using different horizontal datums. One is using the European datum of 1950 and the other is using WGS 84. So you see a graticule on here. So there's a vertical line and a horizontal line on each of the figures. The vertical line is a line of constant longitude and the horizontal line is a line of constant latitude. 
And in both of these figures, it's the same value of constant latitude and longitude. But if you look at where the two lines cross, they cross in different positions and they're offset from each other. So that geographic features have different latitude and longitude depending upon which data we're using. And you can imagine if you are using a chart that's based on European data of 1950, and you're navigating with GPS that is using WGS84 and it's foggy or nighttime, you may think that you are heading into the harbor when you're actually heading into the wall. So it's really important to understand which horizontal datum is being used in a, um, or which geodetic datum is being used for a nautical chart. Other things on the chart, coastline, aids to navigation. We saw coastline in the last figure I showed, and aids to navigation, also known as atons. These little white figures here are different aids to navigation. Coastline is determined through photogrammetry, satellite imagery, uh, LIDAR, uh, these laser scanners that are on uh, boats, for example, and through land surveying. And here's, you know, again, some uh, pictures of people doing land surveying at the coast. The aids to navigation are typically, their positions on the chart are found by, uh, put it, by getting their positions with, with GNSS, for example, GPS. And then the um, dangers to navigation, our position with single beam, multi-beam echo sounders and side scan sonars. And here's an example of, a, of data of a shipwreck and that would be geo-referenced for a chart. Okay, finally, I want to discuss briefly where the field is going and autonomous surveying is, is really the way things are moving. Autonomous, autonomous platforms can have many advantages. Some of them have long duration. So this picture on the top is a sail drone and it can stay out for a very long time. It uses, it uses the wind for uh, propulsion. It's got solar panels. Multi-beams are, are kind of power hungry. So a vessel that size could only do bursts of surveying at, while it waits for, um, in between it would wait for the, for batteries to be recharged or a, a larger vessel could be used with larger solar panels. And USM has used a, uh, is still using a, a sail drone for doing some surveying. Some of them can be, can be used to survey in shallow and dangerous waters without putting people in danger. They can also act as a force multiplier for surveying faster and more efficiently. And here's an example of a autonomous survey vessel that USM is using in, in other institutions as well for mapping the seafloor. This uses diesel power and can stay out for about nine days of surveying. So it can be used as a force multiplier. If, if, you're, if there's a survey ship out, it can carry one of these on deck, put it in the water, have it do surveys for nine hours or nine days, come back to the ship, refuel and, and go out again. So more coverage is able to be done in the same amount of time. Also in the time of a pandemic, you know, these autonomous platforms have a big advantage because you don't have to have people on a boat uh, next to each other for long periods of time. So let me just finish with a couple slides. One is kind of reiterating the relationship between hydrography and oceanography. So they really are synergistic. So examples of hydrography's contributions to oceanography is that it provides bathymetry for coastlines from numerical models, for example. It, the backscatter from the seafloor can be used to give information on different seafloor composition as well as the backscatter from the water column can give information about what's in the water column. And then the, the technology used in hydrography 
is used for precise positioning and chart charting, which is used for oceanography. Now, oceanography uh, also supports hydrography because, for example, we have to know the temperature and salinity structure to know what the sound speed structure is in the water column. And that's really important for multi-beam bathymetry and also for LIDAR bathymetry. Also, tides are an important part of hydrography because the chart datum is, is based on a tidal datum. And the top right picture shows a tidal current chart for the, Bay of, for the Gulf of Maine. And it's an example of how oceanography supports hydrography because this is an important part of nav safety navigation is what are the tidal currents in an area where ships are coming in and out. And finally, if you're interested in hydrographic surveying and you want to find an educational program that's recognized by the IHO and the International Federation of Surveyors and the International Cartographic Organization, go to this link. In Africa, there's only one right now, uh, and it's in Egypt, taught in Arabic. But there is an aspirational program at RMU in Accra, Ghana. Uh, it's been something that RMU has been wanting to implement for a number of years. It takes a lot of resources to mount a hydrographic science program. For example, the one I teach in in, in the US at the University of Southern Mississippi got a big influx of resources from the US Navy to, before it started. It's not something that uh, a university, for example, in the US can even easily support capitalization for a program like this. So RMU is working on that. They have partnership with the Ports and Harbors uh, Commission of Ghana and with the um, local the local office at the Port of Tema. And hopefully in not too many years, uh, there's gonna be a program available in, in uh, West Africa for hydrographic science. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope some of you are, are interested in, in hydrography. And so please, if you have any questions, let me know what your questions are and Hopefully I can help you out if you want to pursue a career in hydrographic surveying. Thanks.